Welcome, everybody. Uh, good to see you here. It's great that we are able to share here this evening. And uh, well, there's clearly some recording going on and for the people as, at home as well. So that's great. Um, hope you can join in and, and follow whatever we are trying to do here tonight. The uh, subject is going to be meditation in a world of action. Now we all know, of course, um, that this world um, is quite energetic. Um, there's a lot of things going on in the world. There's a lot of uh, action in the world. And sometimes we will find there are certain setbacks uh, in our life, things that uh, don't work out as fine or as beautifully as we would have imagined them. And clearly, the fact that we are disappointed is actually because of the expectation that we have how something might go. I have often said uh, about the uh, positivity gurus, for instance. Eh? We all know about them. Um, people that try to uh, make you feel really positive and, oh, let's go for it and let's do this and let's do that. It's all very beautiful. Uh, but a downside of that is that when things do not come true, when hopes do not come true, when wishes do not come true, then actually the opposite happens of what you would expect. A little bit like somebody who has once won the lottery and now you're used to uh, more wealth uh, in a material sense. Now you're used to more wealth, and now you're used to being able to buy just anything you want. And then, <laughs> as we all have seen uh, through the, the, the media, uh, some of these people who have, like for instance, won a prize of a million dollars, they lose their money uh, because they don't know how to handle it, which is not a very interesting subject in itself. But what is more interesting is that after they have lost it, they will feel more miserable than they ever felt before they had that money. And the reason that that happens is because now your expectation has been brought up to a level that uh, this sphere of existence can never um, help and reply in whatever you think you might get. So I do believe that, that it's uh, quite nice to uh, use some affirmations, for instance. You can, for instance, wake up in the morning, especially if you are, uh, by nature, a little bit a uh, person who is easily down, uh, a little bit negative, and you uh, might be able to pump yourself up a little bit. This is going to be a nice day. This is going to be a good day. Uh, everything is going to be fine. Uh, comforting yourself. But trying to achieve certain goals, like for instance, oh, today I'm going to uh, make that deal that's going to be the deal of my lifetime, or I'm going to get the specific kind of job that I always wished for, or today I'm going to find the love of my life, whatever that may be. Um, those kind of expectations usually, in the end, will lead to sadness or dissatisfaction, exactly the opposite of what you're expecting and what you're wishing for. What you're wishing for, as we all know, as we sit here, and that is a, a very important subject, because all of us, as we sit here, have one most important thing in common that we all would like. It's a very simple thing. It's happiness. That's the only thing we really want. And you can put in place of that happiness all sorts of materialistic thoughts like if I would be able to buy this and that car, I would be happy. And if I would be able to get that specific kind of house, I would be happy. Or if I could get that job, I would be happy. Or if I could find that specific loved one, I would be happy. But all these subjects are actually subjects of the outside world. The inner world is where happiness really is. That's where true happiness is found. The outer world is very dependent on all sorts of factors from the outside. And uh, the Buddhist term for this is 
Sabatama uh, Anicca, which means that everything in this sphere, all the natural elements of everything that we can see, are actually um, not permanent. So they will, in the end, come up, we will be able to see them, and they will fade away again. They will fade away again. And this fading away of things in the outside world is exactly where this dissatisfaction is. And often this dissatisfaction is referred to as suffering. I myself don't like the term suffering that much, even though people do suffer, as we all know. But the term suffering implies that every little thing that goes wrong is immediately suffering, whereas most of the things that go wrong in your life is just dissatisfaction. It didn't happen the way that you really wanted it to happen, and now you're dissatisfied with the fact that it didn't happen as you had imagined it. Now, you come exactly to the point which is so important, because what happened was you were imagining it. Your mind was taking you on a path where you were creating expectations that the outside world, and it doesn't matter what it is in the outside world, be it objects or be it people, where the outside world can never give you the reflection of that, that which you expect. People can never give you the uh, expectation that you have. We sometimes think, this is my child, for instance. Well, that child doesn't think he is your child. He thinks he's his own. You might think, this is my husband, this is my wife, this is my lover. But that person thinks he's his such as you do think the same. You think you're yours. And this is exactly the fact that causes a lot of problems. Now, that's in relationships, it's very clear to see. And in uh, materialistic things, it's also very clear to see. I always think about, and we must have all read this once or twice in the news, it's this beautiful story about the man who just bought a very expensive new car, and that's the one that hits the news, and he drives it out of the garage and immediately has an accident. I think it's beautiful, because what actually happens is his whole illusion of that which he thought was going to give him happiness is actually immediately broken, and he might even come to his senses and suddenly realize happiness is not dependent on the outside world, it's dependent on the inside world. So going to the inside world is the most important thing. And going to the inside world is also the most important thing when it comes to um, how to deal with the busyness of life, all the action that's happening around us, uh, just like Rudy just now said uh, before we sat down and before we started, there was actually a lot of loud music outside and they were doing aerobics or whatever that is. Um, great, nice, probably entertaining. Uh, it doesn't matter what happens in the outside world. What happens in the outside world is a perception of that which you think it is. And this perception is actually uh, easy to describe when you look at, for instance, uh, a car accident, two cars hit each other and there's four different people standing on four different corners of the street. Four different people will have a completely different story about what happened. Oh no, the one on the, on the, in the red car was wrong, the one in the blue car was wrong. No, no, no. Okay, so everybody's got a own vision of what they thought reality was. And then the people inside those cars will have a completely different reality once again. He was stupid, he was silly, he was making a wrong turn, no, he didn't give me right of way, whatever it may be. And then an interesting subject I always think is that the person that's uh, riding along with the person in the car always says that the one he was with was right. <laughs> and this is all perception. And because we let this perception um, inflict so much um, importance upon us, we think that this is the truth. Well, the truth is not always what we think, what we can see, because 
judging the truth in itself is already caused by the senses. And the senses, the sense organs, uh, are not that fantastic at all. If you imagine, for instance, that a dog hears six to seven times better than we do. An eagle sees about 20 times better than we do. And he's got 180 degrees vision at the same time. And the dog thinks what he hears is reality, and the eagle thinks what he sees is reality. And none of that is true. It's not so that because an organ is better developed that therefore it's more reality. The reality is that it's all perception. It's all what we think it is. And what we think it is is created by the mind. And the mind itself is just something that uh, makes judgmental um, ideas happen through which we think, oh, so this is my reality. Well, your reality is exactly what it is. It's in that moment, it is your reality. Now, I found that through meditation, uh, <laughs> and many years of meditation, that um, there is one constant there. And that is that when you are in the stillness of being, in, in the quiet and peaceful um, moment of the meditation in the now, that you will find that none of these things really matter anymore. Uh, they all just disappear and they become totally unimportant. So it becomes unimportant that um, something in a day didn't go the way that you wanted it to go. It becomes unimportant that um, a certain dream didn't come true. Um, it becomes unimportant even the smallest and the slightest things, like if the, red was exact, if, if the light was exactly red at the moment that you drove uh, up to it, uh, which can make some people angry. If uh, you entered the traffic jam exactly at the wrong moment, uh, if um, the things that go wrong in your life, whatever they may be, may it be the fact that you left, uh, <laughs> I don't know, your food too long in the oven and now it's cremated food instead of eatable food. <laughs> um, all these things are just perception in itself because that happiness in this moment, in the now, is always there. They are not dependent on the factors of this outside world. And you might say, uh, but when I sit in meditation and I feel a certain pain, I really positively, surely feel it in this body. Yes, that's true. And that's a realization that you feel something in this body. This body is a vehicle. And the vehicle experiences all sorts of uh, phenomena. It might experience a, a sensory feeling of joy. It might experience a sensory feeling of happiness, but it also might experience pain and it might experience sickness and ill health. All these things are part of this vehicle. But then the perception is that we think we are the vehicle. We think we are this body. We think that we are this. But on the other hand, if we are talking about somebody else, which happens a lot, like we go to a funeral and we look into a coffin, and let's say it's your, your most beloved uncle or aunt, or it's your most beloved father or mother, and you look into the coffin and we all say to each other, that's not him anymore, that's not her anymore, that's just a body. We all feel that. So that means that at that moment we realize that this is just a vehicle. But that's quite easy to do when we're talking about somebody else. We're talking about another person. Oh, that's not uncle so-and-so anymore. So that's quite easy. Now we have to really realize that the same thing is about us. Just as we do talk easily about the fact, oh, oh yes, uh, Life has a certain lifespan and, and we get born at a certain moment and we die at a certain moment. But all of us really want to believe and want to think and have the perception, but I will not die now and I will not die tomorrow, maybe later. All of us. And I've met a lot of young people 
that died at a very young age um, through an accident or whatever. So that's very sad in itself, but it's also a realization that it might just happen any moment. Now we're sitting in a beautiful temple and the abbot of this temple, uh, he always says, because during Buddha days, uh, there are always lots of old people in the temple, very old people, like they're in, in Thai styles, very old is already 70, but they're in their 80s and they're in their 90s and they come to the temple and there's hardly any young people. And then he says, well, do you see? When people feel the cold hand of the death on their shoulder, that's when they start realizing, hey, I should be doing something else. I should be doing something different. I should be changing my life now. And now it's beautiful that when you're a little bit younger, and we've got a few younger people here tonight, so that's great. <laughs> so, but when you're younger, then that's a great opportunity. That's a great chance to immediately now realize that happiness is not dependent on the physical body. It's not even dependent on the outside world. It's something that's within. And in meditation, you can realize that your consciousness is much larger than the physical body. Then you realize that the physical body is actually sort of a jail. It's like you feel like you're stuck in this body and you cannot get out. But actually you can get out at any moment in time. And we all have had the experience where we had a very strong feeling about a beautiful place that we've once been to. And maybe in your half sleep state or just in your imagination, you were sitting somewhere and thinking, oh, I get the same smells from that place. I am in that place. Well, that's beautiful because that means your consciousness is everywhere. It is not subject to this body. It's not um, a prisoner of the body. You can actually do with your consciousness whatever you want. And this um, realization you can actually get during meditation. During meditation you can feel that your consciousness is much wider than this more or less claustrophobic uh, kind of body where there is no escape possible. There is an escape and, and it doesn't mean that you have to discard the body. Uh, I always say very simple, you must take care as well as you can of the body. The body is a vehicle that you use in this sphere to present yourself. And to be able to present yourself in this sphere, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you now if I wouldn't have this body. So this body is useful and therefore it's handy and, and quite skillful, as we call it in Buddhism, to take care of this body in a logical way. But to overdo it is the opposite of what you should actually be doing it, with it. To put the body on a pedestal, as we see so many times with uh, fashion models and with film actors and film actresses. Oh, the body is so important that we got to change this and make this better and, and make it more beautiful. And of course, as we all know, it's, it's something that's impossible. You cannot keep the body forever in good shape. There is a moment where the body will go towards decay. And that doesn't matter. It's a realization that if you have learned to live with it from the start, if you've learned to live with the fact that this body will eventually die and fade away, but you are not the body. You are not the body. You are the consciousness. You are this energy. And this energy is one with everything. This energy is part of nature. That's why I like meditating in nature as well, a lot because you can feel now you're one with nature. Uh, I call it the morphic resonance of nature. You and nature can actually become one. It's a vibration that is within you and without you. You are not a drop in the universe, but you yourself are the universe. You can be one 
with the universe. Now that last realization is a couple of steps further on down the road, but a very simple realization is that here and now you can be happy in this moment in stillness. Now to do the next meditation, only a couple of things that you have to know. Um, one is that the third eye the, is actually corresponding with the pineal gland, which is actually in the center of your head. So if you would draw two lines where they cross, that's where the third eye is. And we have all seen these beautiful chakra charts and then see, oh, the th third eye is here, but it's within, it's not without. It's deep within this sphere of the body. And that's one place that we're going to be using. And then a second place that we're going to be using is just two fingers over the navel. So you got that here. You put two fingers on top of it. And this is the other place where we're going to be going. And if you press there a little bit, just try it now. If you press a little bit, you will feel that it's a little bit painful there. Now that's the thing with all the chakras actually. If you press a little bit harder here, you'll feel a little bit pain. If you press a little bit harder here, then your voice changes as you can hear. If you press exactly here, that's the heart chakra, you will feel that it's a little bit painful. Well, it's the same thing if you have really found this spot here, then you will find that it's slightly painful. Okay, well, so we're going to be using that, but it's that spot within the body. So not on the front. Just imagine that there has a huge uh, power stick running through your body and it goes through all these chakras and it ends up in the center here. Okay, so if you would draw a line here in the center there, that's where we're going to try to uh, do our meditation. And why do we do it there? Well, uh, first of all, this chakra is a specific gateway. It helps uh, to more or less let go of the body a little bit so that you don't have to experience the body constantly. And it also um, is an important spot because it's more or less uh, divided by the other chakras. It's sort of uh, in the balance of all the, all the other chakras. So what we do now is a full yoga breath in, and a full yoga breath is actually, you start breathing in your, your belly, and it goes slowly up and then to your chest. Now really do this, because a lot of people think, oh, that's just a breath. No, this breath is very important. It's something that completely calms your normal daily breath. So if you do this, and I shall overdo it a little bit. And then let go through the mouth. And you can make a little bit of sound whilst doing that. You do the same thing again. And let go through the mouth. And one more time, in order to completely put yourself to rest. And you just relax, you can sit in any position and you're also not supposed to be very stubborn in your position. You can just move, the body is still there. And all you do now, you notice the moment where the breath comes into your nose and there is a certain part there, a spot where you can realize the breath passing that spot. 
and it will be in a different place for everybody. You just try to realize in your nose there is one spot where you can notice the breath passing by that spot in and by that spot out. Whatever else happens isn't important. The only thing that is important is you focus on that spot. And whatever thought occurs, you just realize, I am thinking. You don't have to think, I'm thinking this or that. You just realize you're thinking, I wasn't doing that. I was focusing on this spot and you softly guide the attention back to this spot. Whatever happens, it may be sounds you hear, it may be thoughts that occur, it may be a feeling. You just slowly guide your attention back to the focal point, which is this spot in the nose, where you can notice the flow of the breath around this spot in, around this spot out. And your concentration becomes so lifted that ultimately it will be as if your attention is that spot and flow occurs around this spot in and out.
And if you have a wandering mind, realize you are in charge of it, even though it feels like a monkey that goes from one branch to the other, you can make it focus. Try to fully experience that spot and the flow in and out around that spot. Now you bring your concentration to the solar plexus, that spot just over the navel, two fingers, but inside the body. And there you realize this is rising and this is falling. And in the first instance, you only notice the movement in itself. And to quiet your brain, you are allowed to say to yourself, rising, falling, doesn't matter. If you don't need it, you don't have to. Until you fully realize this is rising, this is falling. And we have just talked about the third eye and you try to direct the intention of the third eye towards that same spot. So your third eye turns inward towards the solar plexus so that full attention is there now. No more interest in the outside world. There is only the inside world.
and thus focused, you completely relax in that spot where you realize the rising and falling. The rising and falling is no longer a movement, it is a realization, this is such. So that ultimately you and your total focus and intention are there, nowhere else. Rest in rest, right there in that spot. Nothing else matters. There's only being there now. Relax. There's nothing to accomplish, just being. totally surrender to being there, nothing else is necessary, there all has been accomplished, there is peace, quiet, bliss, and serenity. Just relax. Let now go of all the effort there is just pure being there, that's all. There's only being there, let go of everything else, pure being.
take a full breath in and calmly out to the mouth. And again, a full breath in and calmly out through the mouth. You are still in the solar plexus, but you realize the body, the vehicle, as it is sitting now. And might you have any discomfort, you can change the position. It doesn't change anything as long as your concentration remains in the solar plexus. And bring your concentration up to that point in your nose where you noticed the flow of the breath realize the body such as it is sitting right now And when you feel ready, you can come out of this meditation. I want to blurt out a, uh, a blessing if you are interested in that and uh, so that you can just try to feel uh, what it does to you. Um, it's a blessing that actually uh, sort of pushes what we've just been doing. Um, so try to feel what it does. That's the most important thing. You don't have to understand it. It's just the feeling. What does this create? within me, maybe in your chakras, maybe in your body, maybe in your sphere, maybe in your mind. Para 